Once upon a time, the art of the movies was to suspend belief. Today, the art is to create belief. One of the greatest challenges in the modern cinema was to make you believe that a man could fly. They succeeded in a film called Superman. Hello, I'm Christopher Reeve. You know, I was thinking the other day about some of the strange parts that I've played since I started acting as a kid. One time I was the third guard from the left in Cinderella. Another time I played a tree. In Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale, I played a bear, as well as lords, officers, attendants, etc. And usually I was the etc. Uh, another time I was a Nazi. <laughs> and once I had the privilege of being Catherine Hepburn's only grandson. Well, it was on Broadway anyway. But I think that if somebody had ever told me that one day I would dye my hair black and wear red boots and play a man who flies around and lives by the North Pole, I would have had to say, um, OK. That could be fun. And it was, playing Superman. You know, since the film opened, a lot of people have written in saying, how did you do it? Well, I don't think we should show you everything. You know, I think we should keep a few secrets. But let's go together right now. Let's go back to the beginning of filming, 1977, and let's take a look at how they make a film the size of Superman. And we can meet Marlon Brando and uh, Gene Hackman, Ned Beatty, Valerie Perrine, Margot Kidder, and a lot of the actors and technicians who made the film. You know, Superman's been around for a long time. And the kids who read him in the 30s are nearing retirement age now. But for reasons that aren't very hard to imagine, children have always had a fascination with this character. So I think the thing to do is to start by checking in with the kids of today. Let's see what they think about Superman. Walks into a telephone booth Black and... Superman. <laughs> it must have like a... Hang a coat hanger or a closet where you can put his costumes and then change. Well, he came from let's see, Jupiter. Um, when he's wearing his reporter suit, he might have his Superman suit being washed. He tries to take all the crime out of Earth. I mean, it's the only planet he knows now since Krypton's blown, blown up. He flies and he saves people. Well, that's it. Hi there. Something wrong with the elevator? Going down. Nah. Officer! Ah, good evening, officer. Mooney. Well, they say confession's good for the soul. I'd listen to this man. Take him away. When Marlon Brando stepped on the sea stage at Shepperton Studios, England, it was a momentous occasion in the history of motion picture, for it marked the beginning of filming one of America's greatest comic strip heroes, Superman. Brando plays Jor-El, the chief scientist of Krypton, who predicted the planet was doomed. Susanna York portrays his wife, Lara. They are the parents of the infant Kal-El, who is later to grow up to become Superman. Under the direction of Richard Donner, they presided over the last days of the doomed planet Krypton. The story was to be recreated in epic proportions over the long shooting period. The plains of Canada served as the great wheat fields of Kansas, where the infant Clark was raised under the care of Ma and Pa Kent. In Pinewood Studios, England, the Daily Planet set has been built in perfect detail. Tons of office equipment is brought in from the United States. 
The smallest details were used to recreate the frantic and disorganized atmosphere of a modern American newsroom. Mild-mannered Clark Kent became a reporter at the Daily Planet, where he met its traditional occupants, ambitious reporter Lois Lane, the editor Perry White, and young photographer Jimmy Olsen. In the streets of New York, for some high-flying scenes and the exteriors of the Daily Planet. In the foothills of the Rockies, where Superman's arch enemy and foe, Lex Luthor, hated, abetted, and annoyed by the clumsy Otis and the luscious Miss Teschmacher, attempts an audacious missile hijack. Back in Pinewood Studios again, to an extraordinary set. The cavern of Lex Luthor, nestled under Metropolitan Grand Central Station. He spares nothing for his own comfort, living in the lap of luxury. In the confines of these studio walls, arctic wastes seem to stretch far into the horizon. Styrofoam ice floats on water in a tank holding 800,000 gallons of water. Tons of salt were needed to give the impression of snow-swept plains. This caused many problems because of the corrosive effect the salt had on everything. One speck of it could ruin a camera worth thousands of dollars. Technicians had to wear rubber boots as the salt was eating through their leather soles. Carefully placed lamps, dry ice, and smoke were all assembled to create a mystical backdrop to a magical story. Ash! Superman, the fictional character who, along with Sherlock Holmes and Tarzan, rank as the three most famous men who never actually existed. You maniac. Do you really think you could hide it from me by encasing it in lead? Cut! The story was told to us in 1938. In comic books first, but has been told again and again in cartoons, in books, on radio, on records, in film serials, and on television. It was a bold and risky venture to attempt to put him in a full-length feature film. The idea was the brainchild of a young producer, then still in his 20s, Ilya Salkin. But what, what does he have here? Whether he's going he persuaded his father, Alexander Salkin, and his co-producer, Pierre Spengler, that they should buy the film rights to the character. It was an enormous challenge. So I explained to him what it was. I said, Superman is a man who flies, who can do this, who is good, has terrible enemies, and all kind of fantastic things happen. And he, he immediately clicked. When Elia mentioned it, I started reading all the stuff about. And... Uh, I believe it could be very good as a major film, if it will be done right. With a story by Mario Puzo, the author of The Godfather, and Marlon Brando cast as Jor-El, things began to take shape. Only one problem remained, find an actor to play Superman. I, I thought it should be an unknown at the beginning. Now, they all started working on me, and the commercial side said, we need a star. After we had Puzo and the director, we need a star. So the movie really goes right to the top. And I, you know, I, there's a moment where you weaken, and I said, well, you might be right. So we started looking for stars. And uh, thank God, uh, Redford turned it down. Dozens of stars and hundreds of unknowns were tested, and none of them were right. They kept coming back to a young man they'd seen earlier in their search, Christopher Reeve. At first, they'd considered him too young and maybe even too skinny, but his mature calm made a continuing impact. I wore a big, bulky blue sweater because I thought, oh my God, I've got to look stronger, you know, and I knew I was skinny. I'd been sitting around, hadn't been exercising. I mean, I get out and play tennis and stuff, but I don't in any way do body stuff. So I got the biggest Shetland sweater I could find up in my attic and went to this audition with it and sat there sort of, you know, sort of trying to be, trying to look bigger, you know, and everything like that. And it was Ilya Salkine and Vic Donner, who were the directors. And all they did, they put a pair of glasses on me and they sort of looked at me. Mm -hmm. And we talked about New York and blah, 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 and nothing in particular, and I left. He got the part. But the problem remained, he was too slim. A padded uniform was prepared for him. But Christopher Reeve was determined to build up his own physique for real. 
the point is that when I started, I was a string bean, and Superman's not a string bean. So already, on this diet, I eat four times a day. Uh, I, tell you, I tell you, I'm on a high meat diet, protein diet, uh, vitamin pills, nothing like steroids or anything like that. But, um, I mean, I get to eat as much of as anything that I want, and it's, it's great, you know. The thing is that on this part particularly, you have to start from the outside and work in. You can, you can do all the interior work you want to do, and it's still it's not going to get you to Superman if you don't have the physical strength to go with it. The thing that happens is that the stronger I get, you know, and I'm still not all that strong, but I'm, I'm getting that. The stronger I get, the more it helps my mental attitude towards the part. What sets Superman apart is that he has the wisdom to use his power for good. He has all these powers, but he's got, he's got the kind of maturity, or he's got the innocence, really, to look at the world very, very simply. And that's what makes him so different. When he says, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way, you, everybody goes, <laughs> you know? But he's not kidding. While Superman was getting into shape, so was everything else. The two biggest studios in Britain, housing hundreds of skilled technicians, brought in from all over the world, sprung into action. They faced one of their greatest motion picture challenges ever. Artists had been working for months on drawings that tried to capture this fantastic tale. From the drawings, sets were built so camera angles could be plotted and lighting schemes planned. The actual sets were built by more than 350 construction workers. Most of the sets had to be life-size, employing materials and techniques never used before. In some cases, elaborate models had to be built and had to match perfectly with the life-size sets. All manners of film wizardry were used. Precise lenses with automatic zooms were created. Special camera cranes were built, enabling the model to be photographed from any angle. Camera movement, dramatic lighting, miniature explosions, and breakaway sets were all linked together to electronic consoles, giving it all push-button control from a single vantage point. The whole operation took place under the guiding hand of John Barry, the man who designed Star Wars. Well, Star Wars is much uh, grittier sort of story, this, whereas uh, Superman is, has a much more poetic element, doesn't it? I mean, there he is in a red cloak and a blue suit and red boots. So it is already much more of a fantasy. Krypton was the key challenge artistically for the film. In effect, a new society with a unique environment had to be created. The concept of a world of crystal was conceived to everyone's satisfaction. Crystals are both natural and technological, with a special organic quality that suggests they could grow rather than be manufactured. This is the biggest film stage in the world, and over the next 10 weeks, about 100 people are going to turn it into uh, a magical part of the Arctic where Superman's fortress of solitude is. We're going to, where I'm standing now will be the sea, a lot of pack ice. But soon, all the planning and building must end, and the actors take over. Then the pictures become flesh, and there's magic in the air. My friends, you know me to be neither rash nor impulsive. I'm not given to wild, unsupported statements. And I tell you that we must evacuate this planet immediately. Marlon Brando, for many, the greatest screen actor in the world. You know, I, when I first came on the picture and I heard how much money Marlon Brando was paid for it, I was really upset because I don't think it seemed like much more money than anybody is worth. But then working with him and seeing him on film, to me, he's underpaid. Everything has a price in the marketplace, and uh, so do cars, so do hula hoops, so do useless endeavors, and uh, uh, I don't suppose that actors are any different than rock bands that uh, inflate balloons from their ears, and that happens to catch on. It's what people want to buy. Marlon Brando has an unpleasant duty on the planet Krypton. Before the unearthly faces of his fellow judges, he sentences three ruthless villains, Ursa, Non, and General Zod, to an eternal living death. Specific charges listed herein against these individuals, their acts of treason and ultimate aim of sedition. 
these 